Hello and welcome to the Scry Babies podcast. I'm Lewis Stardust. I'm Tori of the Vest. And today we have guests. Can you see them? They're here. If you're on YouTube, you can see them. If you're not, then that's your fault, I guess. But um, <laughs> then it's not a problem. You can still look. Uh, if we're... you are driving, do not go to look. Yeah. Just keep your hands at 10 and 2 and keep listening. That's actually what they say. You know, when you're on the highway and there's like a big sign that says like to not text and drive. It actually just says this Yeah, it now. says do not watch the Scry Babies podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on Spotify and give uh, us a thumbs up. <laughs> Uh, but we are joined today by comedian MTG and Steve Stillman, who you might have seen on the show before. Uh, they are you can you can you can take the mic if you want to. Okay. Hi, hi, <laughs> hello. We're sharing mics today, so if you see us moving around, that's what that is, I guess. Um, but yes, so we're here to talk about casual versus competitive magic. This has actually been a question that a lot of people have asked in the past. That's a hard thing to say. Um, and so we're going to be talking about <laughs> what it was like for, our, I guess, our beginner journey to magic into playing competitive magic. We actually did a video all about me and Tori recently where we did a uh, Scribe Babies lore video. So if you want to know our story, you can listen to it there. But today we're going to let Steve and Ian talk about themselves and uh, how they got into competitive magic. But first, this episode is sponsored by TCG Player. We would like to thank TCG Player for sponsoring this podcast. Outlaws of Thunder Junction is coming up. So if you're looking to get any of the pre-cons, the play boosters, or some of those collector boosters, be sure to check out TCG Player. The link is in our description below. We had a chance to check out the new pre-cons and also there's tons of new cards. So if you want to get those singles for those new Outlaw Wanted posters, we also have those like kind of from the vault epilogue cards that were put out, which are really cool. And outside of that, there's lots of pre-cons and brand new commanders. So if you want to get any of the cards that sound really cool, or ones that we've been posting about or talking about in general, you can go to TCG Player to find everything you're looking for for this set. Yeah, and you can be sure to find the best prices. And don't forget that these standard showdowns are coming up at the end of April, beginning of May. So if you're looking to buy your new standard deck, you can check out TCG Player to get all those singles that you need. So lots of hot new cards, lots of hot new singles. Again, you can shop for singles, you can shop for sealed product. Everything you need is on TCG Player. Thank you again to TCG Player for sponsoring this episode. Today's feature patron is Carr. Thank you so much for being a patron. Our Patreon features six amazing tiers, and the first one is as low as one US dollar. You can get access to our Discord, early episodes, and you could even join the sticker and token clubs where you get hand-designed drawings by me sent to you every month. Isn't that awesome? Great way to support the show. Uh, yeah, so check us out on Patreon. The link is in the description below. I hear Steve licks the envelopes now, so... He does. Yeah, I do. It's a little something extra. You're, you're getting the full Scrybaby screw. Um, I think <laughs> accidentally that you and Steve have become Scrybaby's members. Like, it just happened, right? And I always joke that you're the scry boys, and Steve always yells that you're the scry men. Um, scry, scry men. Scry men, <laughs> yes. And the two of you have been on our, like, pre-con episodes and some other gameplay. Um, and so I thought it would be a good perspective because the two of you do play a lot of competitive magic, play a lot of events. It's also really cool, like, when we go to play, like, a CDH event when we're at, like, an SCG that you're also there playing. So we get to, like, catch up between rounds, which is really nice. So I guess kind of give us your how you got into magic story. And we'll start with Steve first. So, I mean, getting into magic, it must have been 2010 or so. I remember, I think, Scars of Mirrodin was the set at the time. And uh, my friends, I'm, I was like in middle school or something, and my friends, uh, they all went to Boy Scout camp. Not me, though. I was not a Boy Scout. Um, I am one of the scribe men. Okay, so I can't be a Boy Scout. They all talked about, like, magic all the time, and they, like, showed me their cards. Uh, so I remember my gr grandmother bringing me to Barnes and Noble one day to get like books or something. Cause I'm, I'm an English major and I got a like pre-constructed intro deck and uh, it was just like the rest was history from there. Honestly. Yeah. I was working at a, a summer camp at the time and one of my fellow counselors was like, Hey, here's my like legacy cube basically. And I was like, sure. That seems like a great way to learn magic. And like literally between like when we got our like one hour breaks, uh, cause it was like a 24 hour camp, we would just be like, cool, I guess we're, we're drafting this cube. Um, but then we'd also like make like pre-con decks out of it. It was, it was a whole thing. But then I got hooked pretty quick. I was a couple weeks in, went to the, the local Walmart, picked up one of those like, uh, M14 star things that was that was about it so it was like right around m15 uh cons of tarkir time period i was waiting for you to be like i was the leader of a boy scout camp yeah, and it was yeah. like steve I, was the I, I do feel like though a majority of our friends have said they learned at summer camp or were like a camp mm -hmm. counselor yeah. and they played magic and i think that's a very like common thing for campers 
So maybe if you were in the Boy Scouts, Steve, you would still play Magic. You never know. Mm. Probably not. What is your comp format of choice? Against against my better judgment, <laughs> my competitive format of choice is modern. It's the one I've played the most for the longest, and it's unfortunately also the format I think I've done the best in over the years. There are a lot of reasons as to why I, right now maybe I don't like the format, but uh, yeah, that's that's my format of choice, I would say. What about you, Tori? You're, you're in this too. What is oh. your comp? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not just them. It's, oh, okay. it's all of us. I, I, was, I wasn't sure. I think my format of choice is also modern too. I, modern two as opposed yeah. to modern one. Yeah, modern two. <laughs> Coming out this Post year. Post Horizons, yeah. Modern Horizons two is my favorite format of choice. <laughs> Basically modern. Yeah, modern's my favorite. I think it is the best like range of deck types that I've seen. I feel like I tried playing Pioneer and it was like the same two decks the entire time. Standard yeah. seems like up until this year, no one was really playing it. So I never really had the chance to play Standard. Yeah. And then the other format that I really enjoyed a lot was Popper, but Popper does not unfortunately have enough support here as it does like in Europe. So Modern is the most accessible, I feel like, format to play, which is why I've played so much of it. And uh, I really enjoy it. It's fun. I think that's been like our biggest complaint about Popper. So there's not really like support. There's some here in Philly, like they definitely try to do some small events. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but it's the one I've liked the most because it's more like jank and fun and like I don't know I enjoy it um I obviously don't have a lot of experience with like modern other than playing Tori's deck twice and getting absolutely destroyed by Tori <laughs> um but I think it's really cool and I enjoy it a lot what about you uh yeah I mean I'm, I'm just a just a CEDH guy that's been my thing I used to way back in the day play like standard events when they would be like in my area but like I was never you know on the grind <laughs> uh until very very recently with CEDH yeah I'm definitely uh a CDH person I don't do as well but also every tournament I'm at Ian usually <laughs> does a lot better so at least it's one of us bringing it home I top 16 once it was last year we're gonna try again this year and I I don't know I, I have a lot of fun playing competitive I like playing events where everybody's trying to play at the same level. Um, and then you were talking about Standard, which I feel like has always, since I started playing Magic, we, me and Tori started playing around three years ago, I feel like Standard was never talked about positively, <laughs> at least in my perspective. Yep. And like now it's like, I guess you're forced to kind of play Standard, but it's at least a little more positive reception than I've seen before. I don't know why that yeah. is. I'm standard for years, like prior to like, I mean, I, I think the, the nail in the coffin for Standard was like, the energy decks marvel it was fucking yeah, yeah. Marvel. it was, was, it was marvel and that's when they started and felidar sovereign and that's they started banning cards too too frequently because granted they were quite busted but standard for a very long time was like the premier format that everyone played and that's like the design choices by like the design team at wizards it came through standard everything did um, but then it wasn't the case for a while. Yeah. Yeah. When I was when I was definitely like getting into Magic for the first time, I was like, oh yeah, Standard is 100% definitive. Like, had you told me that EDH was going to dominate the creative space yeah. from now on, I'd be like, okay, guys, sure, the <laughs> the silly format yeah. with a bunch of mill decks, all right. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. All right. So, what first got you into competitive Magic? You'd say, like, what was the introduction into competitive Magic? Uh, so. The first thing that really got me into competitive magic, um, and I, I don't even remember how I watched it. Maybe it was like YouTube videos or if I watched it live, but it was Pro Tour Avacyn Restored. I watched the coverage for that tournament and the top eight was just absolutely stacked in retrospect. Uh, and Alexander Hain won it with this blue white miracles deck. And it was the first time miracles was a deck. I was just like so enticed by how awesome it was. Because all these other great pros like John Finkel like showed up with this deck with Wolfier Silverheart. That's that's a fun magic card. Basically a five mana eight eight um, that no one could beat at the time, which is great. Um, but just watching the coverage and like BDM in the booth, um, I was just like so excited. I was like, I want to like play tournaments like that, and th this is how magic like should be played. Like I, what am I doing with like my unsleeved cards at my kitchen table? You know. No, it's totally relatable. I, I remember actually uh, what got me into competitive magic too was I started um, learning about different magic decks. I learned about Merfolks actually from somebody I was friends with on TikTok. And he sent me a bunch of extra bulk cards for Merfolk and I started watching competitive magic coverage on YouTube. And the first thing I actually watched competitive wise was the 1997 Pro Tour with Mark Justice and Mike Long. And after watching that, I was like, I kind of want to start playing competitive magic. And that's when I started. How about you, Ian? 
Um, yeah, so I, uh, I'm kind of like you all, I was watching, uh, coverage for like a really long time. So that was just like, it was just something I did, even though I engaged with the game casually, it was like, oh yeah, I wake up every Saturday and be like, what's the new spicy standard brews on the, uh, the SCG circuit, right? Which is such a different time. Uh, but it's, it's, yeah, this, so that was like something, once again, I enjoyed passively for a really long time. And then when I got into CEDH, it just seemed like such a natural transition to be like, well, yeah, we're playing competitively, right? So like we can play a tournament, right? Like it wasn't anything where I was just like, oh, I'm going to be a grinder now, but it was just like, well, I'm at every tournament and now I feel like I'm starting to understand what I'm doing. And then there was a transition where I just said like, oh, hey, I'm doing this a lot. And for some reason, you know, my skill is getting better. Uh, <laughs> and then it just like, it was just an upward trajectory um, from that point. Really, I just like spent a lot of time around good players and was constantly pushing myself and didn't even like there there was no point where I intentionally was like yes I'm a CEDH grinder now but it was just like something I had been doing for get approaching years and I was like yeah this is something I really like doing so I'm gonna keep committing to it yeah that uh that grinder label is something that kind of just gets like like you never bestow it onto yourself but like <laughs> others will yeah. you know hand it to you after it's been a while i think you just get it when you take your picture in front of the scg like this and then <laughs> you're immediately yeah. just a grinder no matter what yeah it's so funny like i we were literally at scg hartford the other week and uh i was like signing somebody's play mat and when the person i had played with was like oh are you like a pro and i was like oh, I don't know, like, I guess whatever you can call a pro for CEDH, sure. And then my friend literally looked at me from across the table and was like, Ian, you do this for a job. You are a pro. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess professional. That does actually make sense, well, yes. When you think of Magic Pro, you're not thinking of somebody who, like, like at least to me, I'm not thinking of the person who's, like, you know, teaching people how to play, doing stuff. Like, of course, those people do it. But when I'm thinking Magic Pros, I'm thinking the, the big people with the big trophies and, like, crazy stuff that you're seeing on the Pro Amazing. Tour. Not like you have trophies and you're doing stuff, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. But, like, that's where your brain goes. And I so it takes a minute to think about it that way. Yeah. What? Oh, no, I'm saying, I think I saw the tro the Boyle trophy yeah. in the, in the, on the stairs. Like, I see Yeah, that. yeah. Um, yeah, I – so I always enjoyed – playing just magic in general but i started playing cdh with friends online just because it was fun and i was tired of not playing fast decks or decks that were the same speed as what other people or what i wanted to play i wanted to play fast things and big things and have a good time with it and i made a winota deck <laughs> and i didn't realize it was as powerful as it was i went to my local game store and i was playing on like sundays you would basically play for packs and i made it to like the top table and i won and it was like the first time i ever did that with deck so i was like wow this deck is pretty good and it wasn't tweaked for cdh it was just powerful so then i looked up winota cdh and i found ian's channel <laughs> uh and then i made her more of a cdh deck and i just kind of started my journey of like playing that just with friends and i played with cal who used to be in Playing With Power for a long time. And so uh, between that and like talking to you and some of our friends, I felt like inspired to try a tournament. And I did my first one sometime two years ago. What time is it? Silicon was... No, no, no. It wasn't no. Silicon. It was Oko. Oh, Oko. yeah. Oko. About a year and a half ago at this That's point. That's so yeah. long ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I did my first one and uh, it went fine. <laughs> uh, but I really enjoyed playing it and I enjoyed the community that I was like around. Mm -hmm. So it made me want to play it more. Outside of your respective formats, which were Modern and CDH, are there any other formats you enjoy playing? I know we all do play some Commander, uh, but is there any like comp stuff that you like or do you just enjoy winding down with Commander? I like to play Popper. I don't get to play it enough. I pretty much stick with the same decks that I have, but that's kind of where I do that. And then I've been really enjoying just like classic pre-con Commanders, no changes, really simple. We just played the Fallout ones together and that was a lot of fun to do. But I'm kind of at the point now where I'm like, I want either the highest, fastest, most powerful deck or just like the baby version <laughs> like and that's it i don't want the in between mm -hmm. though i do like brewing our like casual decks that we play on scry babies and stuff that is kind of like my two favorite spots to play commander on like a casual level is really great with like really good friends i mean that's i think it would surprise a lot of people to know that like that's actually how i started a lot of magic was like i've always been a commander person right i got like my first bundle of cards and my friend was like yeah you've made this 60 card deck but it kind of feels like it's just built around this one legendary creature that you only have a single copy of and he was like there's literally a format for this exact <laughs> thing you're doing and i was like okay cool but i've i've played uh, a little bit of every other format i played a lot of standard back when it was like the golden age of standard uh, i played modern for years i almost 
qualified for the pro tour at one point with like one day two qualifier last minute thing i went like five one with ponza which was like my deck of choice for a really long time Tori's uh, gonna go look up your, your thing right now yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm on evil we bring right up the now evil oh, no no wait tori you've already looked it up no, we talked did. about this <laughs> she, did. She, she literally sent it to me she was like i looked this up for ian yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that was that was the thing, and it was a really a lot of fun. I've I've enjoyed playing a bunch of different formats, but back in the day, I was like, "What bad deck can I bring to a standard thing and and do pretty decent with?" And now I'm like, "What bad deck can I bring to a CEDH thing and for some reason actually do pretty okay?" <laughs> we get it. You like Italian. <laughs> <laughs> I do. To like wind down or like relax, I suppose. Like yeah, I really like those like bare bones like precons. I think the precons are like so good at this point, and they're just designed so well. They play well with each other, especially the the Fallout ones. I thought were fantastic. Um, but really, it's like cube. Like cube drafting is like it's still like competitive enough to where I I feel that, but I get to play with all these commander cards uh, that are not historically in like one v one formats. Mm-hmm. Which I guess, you know, you could argue that like some in Legacy there are. But yeah, I just really love like Cube Draft because it's just, it's casual, but it's still slightly competitive. Uh, so I can kind of t- turn off that switch, but I don't know. I did forget to shout out my favorite not format Chaos Draft. It is the best. <laughs> I do like drafting. I, I, I feel like I didn't even speak about like doing sealed or drafting because mm-hmm. we haven't been able to go. Because every time, like the last time we did was... The Phyrexia one, like I feel like. yeah. And actually, we did a Lord of the Rings one while we were at, right, Baltimore. We did. We I forgot get, about that. But that yeah, was yeah, it, because yeah. I feel like I love going to the LGS during mm-hmm. a pre-release. It's like my favorite. It's like Christmas. I'm like, oh my God, it's Friday. We can <laughs> yep. go try all the new <laughs> cards. But we've been so busy with traveling and events yeah. that we haven't had a chance to. So I'm hoping for Thunder Junction. I told everybody we're dressing up like cowboys, and we're going to open <laughs> all the play boosters, and we're going to draft, and we're going to have a good time. And that's like my favorite way to enjoy magic with people, for sure, is like drafting or sealed or something fun. But mm-hmm. Tori. Tell us. Uh, I think my favorite format beside modern is probably playing cube as well. Uh, I love vintage cube. Vintage cube is so much fun. It's so cool to play with powerful cards that you don't really get to play with anywhere else. And I also just love cubes in general that have a good theme. I was fortunate enough to play um, a cube twice now with a group of people who hang out in Philly and cube every like Monday. And this really cool guy has a all pauper cube, but every card in it is foil and signed. So it's just a really, really cool treat. It's something I think that's so unique that like you have almost like a collection you can build. Like same with the commander, you know, you have a commander deck you really like, you collect foils for it or you collect like signed cards. So that's something cool with cube you can do. It's kind of like a pet project that you can still take it apart, play it and have fun with friends. Vintage cube though, I think is by far my favorite. I suck at it. I will be the first to admit I am so bad at vintage cubes. I don't know what any of the cards are. People are like, and the hard part is, is I'm like, what card's good? All of them. They're all good, yeah. so it's hard, but yeah. it is really fun. It feels different. And then I guess my other favorite format is, Steve's going to kill me, is uh, the basic land game. And me and Steve oh, play the basic oh. land game all the time. And Bleep it's out, a great under. time. Oh. <laughs> we do. I, yeah, I, I, the last tournament I played, I brought my deck at home, and I would have been able to get it in time, but I played like eight rounds of the basic land game. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, I missed my like deck, and now I have to miss round one because I was so invested in it. Talking about that though, I, real quick about cube is I think it's it's kind of like the aspect of uh, like how commander is. You can make it really personable. You can make it your own thing. I think that's why people enjoy playing commander, and so I feel like cube is really close to that. I cubecon is a thing, right? And yeah. I saw there yeah. was like some cheese thing. Like, did you see oh, that? Oh yeah, Reed Duke won cheese. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Somebody, so I just feel like it's like a really like silly, quirky. Yeah, and I are like, mm, we're out, we're yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no thanks. Yeah. Uh, but the I, best prize of all. Yeah, I've I've actually never played cube because every time I do it, it's like Alan is trying to get, me get like play <laughs> oh, his cube at like eleven o'clock at night or yeah. like. Well, you, that's the problem is that everyone wants to cube draft at like eleven thirty yeah, after like, a con, and it's everyone's like, like please, I want to die. Yeah. It's like, no one wants yeah. to play Monopoly at 11 no. p.m. No. Yeah. The last time they did a cube, it was after we we filmed, and me and yeah. you were upstairs, like, sleeping, watching the Titanic, having a good time. <laughs> and it was still like, not no. done. No. The iceberg hit, no. and it was still not done. No. Nope. Yeah. So I, I do think that's fun, though. I like the personal aspect. That's true. It. You guys did get to the iceberg hitting. Because I remember walking upstairs and being like, yeah, I got eliminated early. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. You guys came upstairs and you were like, yeah, we're playing cube. And I just remember like we looked at the TV and it was like, I see the iceberg in your eyes. And I'm like, oh, you came up at the worst time. <laughs> How do you train or practice for these competitive events that you play in? I have to live this a lot. So Steve, <laughs> tell us, how do you train and practice for these events that you're in? I mean, it's it's a, it's a very complicated question. Um, 
because like the the preparation like varies from tournament to tournament. But usually like if I don't know the format, it starts with like a lot of like research. So for instance, there's like a, an SCG coming up that's standard and I haven't played much standard lately. So I'll go on mtggoldfish.com and look at all the deck lists and I'll do a lot of reading deck lists and I'll go on Magic Online's deck, li- deck list dump and I will just read deck lists for a while. <laughs> that's what they're called. The I fi- deck list. Deck list yeah. dumpies. The 5 dump. And I'll just, I'll read deck lists for a while eventually, settle on a deck that is like perceived as the best um, because that's, if you want to win the tournament, that's what you should be doing. And I'll just play a lot of Magic Online. And there are diminishing returns on how many matches you play on Magic Online because of it. Like, if you're not practicing well, then you're not, like, actually learning anything. So then it's just, you know, I'll take notes as I do that. And then I'll practice specific matchups against my friends that I know, like, I will expect at the tournament I'm preparing for. Steve's going to hate my answer of preparing for events because I don't. I, um tend to just forget and then pull the old I'll be fine I looked at a deck list online Mm -hmm. and I will simply just nah I'd win I don't ever (laughs) nah I'd win I usually just o two or one two but that's okay it's about the experience it's about the experience sometimes you go off vibes I sometimes (laughs) I run purely on vibes yeah but that's like I don't know instinct yeah at some point it's it's good yeah it's good I feel like our experience is very different because when when I started playing CDH, everybody was like, yeah, I have like a ritual like the night before. I like get in early. I do X, Y, Z things. And I was like, you motherfuckers are lying because I went to the tournament and everybody's up at two o'clock in the morning, wasted, <laughs> testing out their deck, going nuts with people. And it's just not that at all. <laughs> you know, I... I, I I, the way I practice is like I try to just like play online if I get a chance to, but I'm kind of like you. I'm like, uh, oh, we we make it, we make it. And I I think CDH is a little different because, <laughs> you know, we're we're getting new cards, but not as frequently as your stuff is changing. I think and like the struggle we had with Scribe 60 before is we would play decks and cards would get banned really quickly. Immediately. Sorry. And so what's Scribe 60? It's gone. Rest in peace. Okay. That's it. Um, <laughs> but like even like, you know, when you were you were you did really good this year. And we'll get back to us training in a sure. second. But you did really good. And I know you weren't able to go play events because yeah. your dog had a surgery. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but even the decks you were playing, like as soon as you were done with that, what fear got banned, right? Was that what it was? Yeah. The, yeah. There are two decks that I played in a tournament and then the monday after the tournament the a card from them was banned that i had recently purchased yeah and you, you buy those things <laughs> yeah. and you train so hard for something to just like go away i feel like that would stress <laughs> me out more than anything but yeah so I, I i i get the privilege of living with ian and getting no coaching <laughs> except this whoa <laughs> wow. wow all the time i want the record to show i offer it every day we've been doing 30 minutes of attracts coaching a day and I, I don't even know if i'm gonna play the deck in next weekend it's so hard. yeah it's still- it is hard. For something. Uh, but yeah, so I like to just kind of like at least like play with the cards and like fishbowl a mm. lot more than actually Gold testing. Fish. Gold fishing, fishbowl. <laughs> no, you know I like fishbowl. Oh, we're in the fishbowl. You're, you're like in a, uh, yeah. a fishbowl. I am the you fish. You fish 60 card decks, you fishbowl EDH yeah, decks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's 100 <laughs> cards, it's the whole bowl. So trademark it, put it on a shirt. All right. Uh, but yes, I will let you explain what you do because it's interesting because Steve was also <laughs> talking about how it's the best decks in the format that people mm. will try to play for like modern and stuff. But obviously that's not like technically a thing in CDH. It kind of is. Yeah, CDH is fucking weird. Uh, <laughs> it's No, I mean, it's really bizarre because it's a format where um, the concept of a best deck exists, but it is a self-balancing format, right? So if you show up with the most feared deck in the tournament, you are often going to be hated out of the room because you instigate an immediate game of 3v1. I do definitely... You know, I say this to people all the time when I talk about my preparation process, right? So, like, I have a lot of, like, health stuff I do, right? Like, where I wake up early, I eat certain foods because I have a really bad dietary restriction and, like, a bunch of different stuff like that. But that's not, like, the prep process for a tournament, right? So, for me in CEDH, I'm living, breathing, existing this format. I'm coaching it if I'm not playing it. And if I'm doing that, I am literally existing in this format 24-7, right? So for me, it's not like I have to technically sit there and like play games over and over again, right? Like the meta doesn't shift enough where I'm like, oh, this giant fundamental change is hitting. And if it is, it's like, well, cool. I've talked to 15 people about it already to a point where I'm like, between my experiences and their own, I already have a pretty solid grasp about what this giant shift is. Like, 
uh, not to like toot my own horn, but I, I definitely have predicted several giant meta shifts months before they've happened. And it's just because I, this is a very, you know, uh, it, it, it's a slow moving ship that like, if you're standing at the front of the ship, you're like, oh, hey, it's it's turning right. But everyone in the back is like, whoa, the ship's turning? Whoa, <laughs> that's like crazy. But yeah, I mean, uh, as Lil kind of mentioned earlier, we, you know, CEDH players definitely are not the, you know, get a good night's sleep, wake up uh, prepared because it's, I mean, it, I think it's part of it is like, it's a social format, right? So like the people that play it are inherently like, oh, hey, I'm I'm entering a place with all of my friends and I can engage in not 1v1 iterations all the time, right? We can sit at a long table where two pods can sit and six people will watch while there's two games going on and everyone's just like having a good time being social. It's definitely, uh, you know, the uh, <laughs> it feels like the what theater kids are to college is CEDH players to competitive events. <laughs> That's a good way to think. <laughs> I do think there's a lot of pros and cons, though, of it being mm-hmm. like a four-person <laughs> thing because at least with 1v1 it's like you and that person for that match versus you and three people in one match that you have to like right. carry on and i think it'd be really cool to kind of talk about like the differences between those two formats and mm-hmm. i think there is a perception online at least or you know sometimes a person like oh we'll, we'll make jabs at each other but i never think it's serious but i think some people really feel heavily like obviously you know this is not a sanctioned format it's mm-hmm. not a thing that you know for cdh at least yeah. that is um being viewed in the perspective of like wizards putting on events because it's, yeah. it does not exist but sure. we just like there's an event we're going mm-hmm. to in ohio that just sold out for like 256 people right yeah. something like in that in four hours in four hours yeah. And so, like, there's definitely room for, for growth and there's definitely room for mm. the attention for people wanting to play these events. Yeah. Um, so I would love to hear kind of just, like, misconceptions of, like, your format or what people think it is, especially because I think those aren't always true. Mm-hmm. Or maybe the differences that you see within your own or another, you know, CDH versus, like, modern, essentially. Not really versus, but, like, mm-hmm. yeah. I feel like there's a lot of – we see it a lot online a lot, too, where people kind of have a lot of – made up their minds about things that necessarily aren't true like you were saying like i often see a lot of people who like to say like oh cdh is a format for failed grinders it's for people who who couldn't who couldn't do well so they suck at this format so they go to edh and that way they could be good there which is entirely not true i mean if you look at like cdh in general like some of the greatest 60 card players are in there like look at koval he plays and like brian cook plays too i think right yeah, Sperling's in there, Sperling's Sperling, in there. Yeah. yeah um and there's just a lot of like you know, eternal format enjoyers who like CEDH, Mm -hmm. whether playing it competitively because they still play it as a competitive format or like Koval said before, it's like, I love playing this format for fun. It's really fun. And I still compete at all the SCGs. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's just a really weird way to put it. I feel like people can like different things and that is okay. Like if you are someone who, I love playing CEDH with my friends because I don't think I could compete with CDH because I am an awful politicker. Horrible. Can't do it. I straight up like played a game on mod stream the other night and I literally was like playing with Thraben U and I was like, don't block my Ragavan, please. And he was like, I'm gonna block your Ragavan. And I was like, no, you won't. And he blocked it and killed it. And I was like, yeah, that did not work. This is why I cannot do this. Do not do that. You will always block your Ragavan. Um, so yeah, I think that is one of the biggest like preconceptions that I really can't stand seeing is people always seem like you have to be on team one or team other. Yeah. And not just play both and have fun. Do you feel like mm-hmm. there's anything for modern? Like, I think, you know, people come to say, I think a big thing for us when we were playing on Scribe 60 is that people thought that it couldn't be fun. Yeah. Like, a lot of people have the notion, too, that competitive magic players are mean or that uh, they don't want to help you, that they only care about themselves and the game and that they're kind of like look down on people who play Commander, which like there are some people who are like, I feel like it's the loudest crappiest voices are always amplified the most in every community so in every community so you always see people online who get boosted who are like oh see like like, i can't hear i don't like opinions from edh players but it's like if you talk to people who are really good they enjoy all the formats and you know what a lot of the grinders and 60 car players i've met have been nothing but nice nothing but helpful and at the end of the day like they all love magic which is why we all play it so who cares how you enjoy it just play the format you like I mean, it's 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 difficult for a lot of people to see that, um, and and I, I agree that everybody should just like, you know, especially competitive like sixty card grinders, should just let everybody like what they like. I, I I feel as if a lot of them are bitter in a way because they they played Magic in its or their version of Magic in its heyday, and now the you know the 
the draw of magic and where all the money is going has shifted to commander. And so they're sort of bitter and they kind of like take it out on CDH players and, or EDH players, whatever it may be. Steve has a lot of thoughts. I do have a lot of thoughts, but I also think they, they don't understand that it's like, sure, there is some overlap in like, obviously like sequencing of, you know, your spells properly, like yeah. transitions into CDH. But what a, lo a lot of competitive grinders or competitive players like don't understand from my side of the community is that like they're different games mm -hmm. and they fail to recognize that the like competitive integrity in a um political social game yeah. um which like so they discredit cdh for that reason without understanding that they're like vastly different games for instance like survivor is a competitive game <laughs> and cdh is similar to survivor yes, it but is. like <laughs> magic like just 1v1 magic is more like chess and poker where you like yeah but those elements are also present in cdh still to some degree it's like it's like comparing like a uh, a fortnite match right compared to like <laughs> 1v1ing someone on cod right like it's like a whole different reality where you're like yeah. oh there's a single person here as opposed to like all right well i got jimmy but then the other dude shot me in the back of the head right like it's like that is what cdh has like the, the comparison for it for sure and and like one thing that i struggle with or i know that would like not get me eaten alive in a tournament, but is definitely to my detriment if I were to go play a CDH tournament, is just, like, my table presence. That's something that, like, you have to be very, like, conscious of at a CDH tournament where you have to be, like, kind and nice. It's very <laughs> whereas, yeah. Yeah, whereas, like, I was told, I was taught to, like, you know, not bleed any information at all to just be a stone wall and be like stern. Yeah. Um, especially with like the way that the rules used to be a little more harsh. Like if you accidentally drew a sideboard card in game one, even if you called the judge, you got a game loss. Like, it, you know, things were just, yeah. you know, so harsh. And that's like, it doesn't have to be that way in CDH. And it's like to my detriment because they'll be like, what's this guy's deal? Like, we yeah. should, like he's plotting something or he's just mean and we should just get him out of this table. Like... <laughs> And it's know. like, it doesn't even have to be like that explicit, yeah. right? Like a lot of the times it's just like, well, okay. When I made some sort of comment about this guy's commander, this guy was like, oh yeah, ha ha ha. As opposed to like, you know, stone face Steve, who's like, my commander is fine. Right. Like, yeah, and like that's yeah, the, yeah. It, people are like, oh, that guy's hiding some shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think there is like, you have to be a little more personable mm -hmm. in that format because it is a social format. Uh, and you're saying, you know, you, you really don't bleed your cards. There's people that, like, they bleed all the time. I'm like, dude, please pick up your hand. I can see everything in your hand, right? Oh, but yeah. also, like, we just kind of show people cards. So we'll be like, yeah, trust me, here's this card. Like, that is a... I, I think I have, like, a record for the amount of times I've shown someone my entire hand before. Yeah, yeah. that's it, that's like an asset. Yeah. It, yeah. Like, it's like, yeah, you can trust me. Here's the card. Like, mm -hmm. take a look. And I also mean just, like, even, like, bleeding information with body language oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like there are so many times where i've like had to act like i have it like you know against an opponent in a match where like you know if i don't have it they they win um but in in cdh it, like i can be more like laissez-faire and sort of just kind of you know talk to my opponents yeah. and like <laughs> I can intentionally give away information if mm -hmm. I want to, yeah. like showing people cards in my hand. Right, yeah, information like is more transactional as yes. opposed yeah. to yeah. like if you leak it out in in one v one, it's like oh god, I have made a strict mistake, right? Yeah. Where in yeah. CDH, I'll be like, oh yeah, I have this thing, right? And I can have something completely different, but I'm like, oh, this is the thing I have. Yeah. Or or in situations where like that, where someone has bled their entire hand to me, I'll be like, oh, you can cast that spell though, bud. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's CDH is definitely like you're winning, like you're playing to win for your but mm -hmm. it becomes like a 3v1 game right mm -hmm. like we have to stop this person we have to do something i really enjoy about like modern and watching you guys train for like events and prep for stuff is like we don't get testing houses you guys yeah. do like cute little testing houses and i know it's not probably cute and little but like <laughs> yeah, i, I think like, have you been it's like sweaty you know but it's <laughs> this like it doesn't always have to be like the path to the pro tour it doesn't always have to be the path to like this big event but i i like that you guys create this space where, you know, you can brew decks together. Like, I know your server was brewing a Rhinos deck. And I know that you can, like, go to the space and you can have the sense of community, even though it's an individual, like, sport where you're just playing that 1v1. It's nice to know that there's such a big community of support and, like, the availability to test things and to share that space with other players, I think, is something really cool and that I enjoy um, from the outside perspective, too. If, if if someone of like, you know, the 10 people I prepared with, if one of us wins or top eights or does well, it's a win. Like it's, yeah, it's a really great part of my magic. Do you feel like there's any 
misconceived notions about CDH or like other stuff that you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, we we did cover a lot of uh, the the misconceived notions there for sure. Um, there's, I mean, there's so many things with CDH. It, it, it is a young blossoming format, right? And I, I feel like a boomer when I. <laughs> Sorry, young blossoming. I don't know. I mean, it's very young yeah, compared to every other magic yeah, format. That's what I'm it is young. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, that got me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. But like, in comparison to a lot of formats, like it has room to grow. And like, sometimes I'll be talking to people in my my sessions, and I'm like, oh, I sound like a boomer because I'm like, I remember back in the days of Flash Hulk, and like, uh, or when you know, uh, we talked about Sharoom the Hegemon the other day, and I was like, this was good because it was a commander that actually comboed, and we're like, now we get that, plus it draws us three cards, and also like fill in the blank here. But um, I mean, there's, there's there's still so much, and it's only a couple years old, realistically, from and especially from a competitive sense. I mean, we went from in my career playing this format went from like oh we have one big tournament on cockatrice a quarter to oh we were really? we were mm-hmm. big on, on we were on cockatrice Seriously? yeah yeah because it was the only client that could handle like, it yeah yeah, yeah. Wow. and it, apart from online but like it just that is like an oh, investment yeah. that no one wanted to make yeah, ever yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but yeah, we went from a, a cockatrice a quarter tournament to now i think if you like check edh top 16 there's straight up like almost 10 tournaments a weekend if you count like the smaller ones and then for like larger 60 plus which is like kind of the cutoff we, we tend to look at it's like there's at least two a weekend which is crazy like that that's i mean i remember uh right before covid where there was a tournament um run by ddm gaming it was their one and only tournament because then covid happened uh but it was a 64 person tournament and everyone was like oh my god this is the largest in-person cedh tournament and now we're gonna do a 256 next month or not i guess in june but yeah Wow, six. I didn't know the sixty four was like the largest pre pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That's kind of like our like it's, small one now. Is always like yeah. a sixty four is mm-hmm. kind of like where mm-hmm. the you know the bigger ones are or the smaller ones. The are. threshold, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but even when I started playing, which wasn't that long ago, I feel like there was less tournaments. Like I feel like they oh, yeah. tripled mm-hmm. in size, which is pretty cool to see. Yeah, I guess with everything that we've talked about, has there been any like hardships with like the, the format that you're playing um as far as <laughs> as far as like you know no. you as a player or like oh. things that you know like, anything that you, like sorry i know there's a lot of yeah. hardships but for you is there anything that stuck out or maybe like you know you've struggled with a thing so here's a pure piece of advice on it or you know something that was like big for you that was really difficult that you want to talk about yeah i don't know this isn't really the most positive podcast topic uh i've been like harassed online a bunch of stuff like that and and you know once again new young format very very uh there's a lot of stuff still still had to that that growth that needs to happen in with uh not only the community but like people in general um but I also look at like one of my, you know, like content idols who's like Wolfie VGC. He was like one of the best Pokemon players in the world, right? And he is still gets like accusations of of cheating and stuff like that. And people like say pretty horrible rants and things on his stuff. Uh, and he's, you know, got a resume that would, you know, intimidate most people of any game, right? So uh, I think that's always going to be a thing in competition. People are going to be, there are pros to competition. There, there are downsides to competition. Um I wouldn't trade it for the world. I love what I do for a job. I love, you know, competing and it, there's a lot of positives to it. But yeah, when you when you tell people that their their worth is quantifiable, right? Like your results quantify how much you are worth. It, it is going to lead to negativity. That's what I was going to say too. I yeah. feel like it is like some of the most like mentally exhausting thing mm-hmm. not only like prepping to get in that space for a tournament like i know for the two of you like the stuff that i've seen you do for tournaments is a lot mm-hmm. and the pressure that is on you to do well especially if you are winning or and you're doing well at these events the next one you have to be as good or you have to be better <laughs> and it is a constant like struggle and i'm really grateful that like you know for me and you like we're, we're playing like to be better me and you i feel like uh, me and tori are you know playing really hard to be a better magic player and it would be really cool if the two of us could get to a point one day where we can play at like a high you know value event of course um but i feel like you know maybe we aren't pushing as hard we're not staying up late and Mm -hmm. and studying and doing those things i'll be the first person to say i don't want it bad enough yeah that is cedric made a really good post about it one time where it was like you have to want it and if you don't want it enough it's not gonna happen and it's too true and i've said this all the time i'm like i truthfully right now with my life with having you know a full-time job and we do scry babies full time um and then just I was in three weddings last year, which was yeah. a lot of time. It is a lot of time. <laughs> um, I said, I was like, I don't have time to prepare. I don't have time to think about magic that way. 
and I don't want it bad enough at this point in my life where I can achieve that result. So I'm going to be okay with just getting a little bit better right now. Yeah. You know? Um, but All back right. to the back to the hardships of the format. One thing I want to point out, especially with like what you were saying, I feel like it has to be a very big hardship to get over in the CDH community in general is and I'm happy it's changing. The online tournaments for I've seen with, with Steve with One Piece, you with CDH. It's such a hard thing in itself because of the people who have cheated before or had a webcam issue. People, I feel like with online results, will always question it. Be like, well, how do we know? Mm -hmm. How do we know if you're being honest? Yeah. How do you know there's not that person's not cheating? They have to cheat if they do well so much all the time. Like Steve did pretty well at One Piece tournaments multiple times on online. And it's still people are going to be like, well, how do I know you didn't cheat? Yeah, it's like... There's an asterisk. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it's like, mm -hmm. trust me, bro, doesn't sound good enough sometimes <laughs> yeah, to yeah. people. And that's like the great thing about seeing CDH grow with all of the tournaments coming out is mm -hmm. like, it kind of like, shut up <laughs> to yeah, those yeah, people. Yeah, it's like, yeah. yeah, I did good here too, where there's a bunch of people and judges watching. One of, so. my, one of my favorite stories is there was a playing with power tournament where the stream they cropped to do like a fun little animation on the edge, right? And some person in the comment was like, you can't even see the edge of Ian's desk. He's clearly sliding cards off. And it was like, if you looked at my webcam, there was like, like half of the thing was like off. You could see like a full foot off of my desk. And they were like, we clearly caught him. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, dude, it's the stream overlay, but nice try. <laughs> got him. <laughs> like Just clowns. your toes. Yeah. <laughs> can't let him have them for free. <laughs> yeah. yeah, playing with power was censoring my toes. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Classic Twitch chat, finding um, lethal. What, 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 what have been some right. hardships with the uh, with right. the competitive magic that you've faced? Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, I've faced a lot of hardships. I feel like uh, you ask anyone who like played GPs every weekend uh, to try to get together enough pro points. You know, there are going to be so many hardships. But like to narrow it down specifically to like the modern format or or, or something, I would say like, and and Lua brought this up earlier, just about how I'd like prepared for a tournament played in the tournament, and then the Monday after, the card in my deck is banned. Um, there's this, like, weird... What used to be a feature of modern, uh, like, of modern is, like, sort of, like, a detriment now, uh, in recent years, at least, where, like, it's an eternal format, so cards don't rotate. So a lot of people used to become, like, deck specialists, and I'm sure this is a thing in CDH, mm -hmm. like, Winota or, or whatever, like... Rest in peace. Yeah, yeah right? <laughs> and that's, like... I used to play like modern ad nauseum when that used to be playable whoa, uh, and it was whoa. still not, it, it was still like not very good. But like if you mastered your deck, you could like be oh, rewarded yeah. and like win with it, even though it wasn't that great. Yeah. Um, but like that eventually now decks like that don't really, you know, hold the candle anymore in the current format, but uh, that would like hold you back as a player because even if you're like working on this one deck, it's like good to get started with, but you're not going to win ultimately. But the flip side of it, which is another hardship, is like if you're constantly p playing the best deck, it has a target on its back. And sometimes it's like too broken for the format, mm -hmm. like Hogak, which dominated the <laughs> format in 2018 or 20, uh, Wait, 2019. You, you mean three pre board ley lines wasn't <laughs> good for yeah, the format? Yeah. Like right? the only other good deck in the format. <laughs> was like blue white or uh because it had rest in peace or yeah, burn yeah, yeah. with rest in peace in it yeah. and like um yeah there's hogak then there was scam like so your cards just get banned immediately and the rug gets pulled out from under you but like that's sort of becoming accepted like as a an aspect of like constructed magic where it just like yeah you have to be ready to pivot because you know this deck's getting banned like you, i sure hope you bought your ardent please because violent outburst got banned right. Um, yeah, for the most recent SCG, I bought Living Ends, like, the, the week of knowing that maybe there'd be a ban, so I did this to myself, but I bought Living Ends because it was so good, and then literally, like, five days later, cards banned, or unplayable. Right, and I remember, like, back when, uh, speaking of old standard, right, there was that period where it was, like, Smuggler's Copter and yeah. a bunch of cards like that got banned super quick, and we were, like, a Reflector Mage, and we were, like, yep. this is more bans in a standard season than there were in history of standard, yes. right? Yeah. And that was, like, that felt like the transition point to where now we're just, like, uh, that guy's been annoying for a week and a half. You're dead, kid. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's, like, not even, like, right, like, to yeah. ban the card, because sometimes if you just wait a little bit, like, and something else is going to come out, and that's going to push that out. Right, right. Because I remember, like, back when Stoneforge Mystic got banned in Standard alongside Jace, mm -hmm. that was, like, 
the the most insane thing. No one had ever yeah. heard of it because the, the like bands never happened. Um, but then it was just like yep. it's just the norm now. So that's like a really difficult part. I'm upset about the beans because that was like oh yeah yeah <laughs> I didn't play, the as well. but I thought that was like uh, the com- I like seeing the community be excited about something stupid like the sloth thing yeah, recently yeah. too. Mm-hmm. Um, I just oh, I did, yeah yeah the sloth depths or yeah. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I just like seeing the stupid stuff, and I think yeah. like you know that's kind of your brand yeah. too with CDH is you play the stupid stuff and you mm-hmm. win with the stupid stuff. So when I the beans were taken over, I was like this is the best thing ever, and I'm really excited about it. And so it, that sucks. And also I understand if a card is too powerful. Powerful, like obviously has to get banned because it's not right. good for the health of the format but like i again would be so stressed out if i played your formats and i had to be like fuck i gotta go buy a new set of cards or play mm-hmm. a different deck or try something else all the time yeah. Yeah. that was um for uh for pioneer recently and pioneer is another one where like there were a lot of bands early on in, in, in the format which made sense that was, well, the, the, at least with pioneer they were like this is like we are going to give you as much freedom as possible and then we're gonna kill everything you love yeah right? like that was the concept at the very least yeah exactly um and like even recently like last year i remember buying a bunch of cards for the um discover deck it was like the quintorius deck mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Sorry, he's cursed now. Yeah, yeah, right. But like, but yeah, exactly. That's another <laughs> cursed, funny card that yeah, like right. the community rallied around. And then like two weeks later, because it was geological appraiser was too good. I was, you know, it was banned. And um, so I like owned all those cards, and then I like bought you into did. another deck. Wait, what? You did. I, yeah, I bought all those cards, but I bought them before they spiked. Yep. For what it's worth, <laughs> that was the only like luck that I had. Um, they're a band, unplayable. Buy a new deck. All right, I'm ready to go to the RC. Get sick. Can't go to the RC. So just like buy two decks. Mm-hmm. Don't get to play either of them. Uh, so it's just like, yeah. But that's also like, I'm sure that's with CDH it, in the SCG events because you have to own the cards instead of like being yeah. proxy. Well, that's, I mean, that's the, the, the thing with CDH is like, it does have that initial barrier to entry, right? If you're not talking about events that are pro proxy, right? Um, and then... From there, though, like the things you were talking about earlier about like deck specialists, and this is what's attracted me to CEDH is like it's felt like that old modern where it's like the metagame is super diverse. There's percentages. There's like a couple clear front runners, right? But once again, it's a self balancing format, right? Like I've been ranting about how Kinnon is the best deck for months, and now all my Kinnon pilot like coaching people are like, yeah, well, I I step in the room and everyone's got a crowbar and they keep looking at me funny, and like you know, what I mean, it's it it just will auto correct, right? So you can play, you know, for example, Gruel is Ali. We mentioned it earlier, right? Like it's it is a very stupid, silly dinosaur, and yet at the same time, like it, with enough maneuvering, it is uh, a playable deck if you get really comfortable with it, right? I do like the CDH is self balancing <laughs> in that way, um, be- because like, if people like overcorrect in constructed, mm-hmm. and it's like people are playing, okay, okay, every deck has four Leyline of the Void in it. Hmm, maybe something's wrong here. Like, right. that's when they look, and when the format starts to warp, like warp is the word they always use. That's like the bad thing. Out of the events you've been to, do you have any favorite memories that you would like to reflect on? Post-event dinners are, like, my favorite thing mm. ever. When oh. you and your friends, yeah, like, have just been grinding all day. Like, I mentioned the SCG earlier when we just played in Philly. It was really cool to be, like, I'm running the bathroom. Oh, Steve's there. Let me ask him how his day's going. And, like, kind of getting to, like, have that experience with your friends throughout the weekend, even though we're playing different formats, was really cool. Mm. But the post-game dinner where you're, like, destroyed and you're fucking telling like each other about what your score is for the end of the day and you're sweating and you're exhausted yeah. and you haven't eaten all day because all you had is one granola yeah, bar it's 10 lucky. PM. yeah like yeah. those are like my favorite dinners and moments to have at like comp events for mm-hmm. sure yeah i think one of my one of memory i have that makes me smile is actually thinking back on it now because at first i remember actually texting you and it was when i went to dream hack with steve to the dream hack atlanta my first dream hack and there was a testing house, and Steve wanted to go to practice uh, Pioneer. I think that was, yeah. yeah, we were all playing Pioneer. And I remember I walked in, and I texted Lua, and I was like, I have imposter syndrome. I feel so out of place. Like, I feel like a big baby with, like, I want to play my pre-con to get to all these people who are, like, you know, trying to get into the PT. But I had a really good time. I met a lot of cool people there. Uh, everyone was, like making burgers and I was helping like make burgers and like caramelize onions and watching everybody prepare for the tournament. And it was just really cool because I think that's the first time I got to see like, Oh, like everybody in here has worked so hard and is so passionate about this. And like, I remember feeling like, you know, I know everybody in that room must be like, Oh, I gotta do well this tournament. I gotta do well this tournament. And I was just thinking like, 
how cool are all of you that you got here Mm -hmm. in the room you know like you made it here that's so cool like just to qualify and get there and like have this that you put so much of your attention and time and passion into and it was just really inspiring like at first I felt a little bummed out and defeated but then like after the weekend and I sat in the hotel room and like kind of thought about it I was very inspired because I was like that is really cool like even if you don't do well in the tournament you at least are still going and have something that you care about in life that's just not like mundane work house this but like it was just really cool to see I think that's also a really good perspective because as that player and from what I've heard from many players who are at that point like it's not not that it's not huge for them to be there but like it is everything if they don't win if they yep. don't succeed and mm-hmm. so it's really hard for them to see and I'm not that player I can't speak but from what I've heard from people like it is heartbreaking like if you are at this point and you can't get there right so it's hard to see your own accomplishments and worth in that and I think it's a really nice outsider perspective to be like how cool is it is that you're here and you're doing this thing yeah. that was like special and profound my my good memory <laughs> is nothing like that but um <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it's really difficult to balance that, like, positive and, and negative. Like, you want to want it bad enough um, to where you care and, like, you're happy when you win. But then you <laughs> can't be too upset when you're, like, right. when you lose because you have to focus on the process mm-hmm. and not the results. But, yeah, I, I feel like, I mean, of course, I, I love, like, the gathering aspect of all all these tournaments um, or Nerd. whatever. But, yeah, right. <laughs> and, I, and that's, like, the saying because it's, like, you know, at the end of the day, like, if if you lose, like, you still have to – try and have a good time over all the years that that i was grinding tournaments i didn't top eight a grand prix and qualify for the pro tour and of course that like crushes me still but it, you have to like celebrate your like small victories mm-hmm. and uh one of mine which is like not my biggest accomplishment or whatever but it's like this like long-standing meme that i couldn't get past 11 wins at a grand prix so I, no matter what my starting record was going into day two i would just like get stuck at 11 wins and like go 11-4, 11-3, one, whatever it was, because one of my friends um, at the first tournament that I w- had done really well at, which was a Grand Prix in Vegas, and it was a huge tournament. It was like three or four thousand people. I was nerve. I was very nervous. I go up to him with I have my headphones on, and he's like, "Oh, hey, Steve. I haven't seen you all weekend. What are you doing today?" And I'm just like, "Oh, I'm I, I'm in the Grand Prix still." And he's like, "Oh, really? Like." you're in day two. That's huge, man. Like, what's your record? And I'm like, I'm 11 and one. I'm trying not to think about it, Veepin. And he's just like, <laughs> and he's like, dude, what? You could top eight. This is like a 4,000 person tournament. It just starts like hyping me up. He's like, do you know how much money's on the line right now? I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I'm trying not to think about it. And so that happened in like 2017. And I lost out that day. You know, wheels fell off, got destroyed. And then not until 2020, was I able, even after I started day two at 9-0, to get past 11 wins at a Grand Prix. And it was the um, one of the last Grand Prix, technically, um, before COVID. It was Grand Prix New Jersey. And I finally managed to uh, 12-3 mm-hmm. um, while beating a good player in the end, you know, while my friend watched who had lost to that player, Andrew Cuneo. Um, I, I don't know if he's a Hall of Famer, but he's like, he's up there. Um, so it was like really special, and I finally like broke the Veepin curse after years and years <laughs> of it. Um, and it, yeah, and so like you know, sure, I didn't top eight or whatever, but like I, I look back and I'm like, oh, I broke the Veepin curse. Like that's all I care about. <laughs> you married Madame Zeroni up the mountain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> everything yeah. comes back to holes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Long winded story, but you know, it's a good one. <laughs> Don't laugh at the hole. So I like two that are really like resonant right so like we talked about some of the 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 pressure and like the downside of like what happens when you don't get there right um because i went to a bunch of major tournaments i was able to win a couple leagues and stuff like that and like like for for a while i I had like done very very well but not no like actual wins and then um i got a couple and moving forward but the like hitting that uh back to back of of specifically when i went to the crimson lion event and won my time twister and then eight days later won the other one i was like it legitimately was i was floored like i was numb for 30 minutes in the best way though like it was it was unbelievable that like the the work and the effort and the energy had paid off in such an awesome way and it's like it it feels like this wholly unbelievable thing but like yeah like when you mentioned like like you've got to want it like it, it, the insanity you go through like lou has been there when i've when i've lost in top four when i've lost in top 16 like 
in in big tournaments and like major accomplishments and it still feels like nothing when you don't get that final win but and, and until you do when you do and it's 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 amazing it, it feels like nothing else um and then the other one was just uh after the fir- first punt city which was the first major eminence event with the first 160 person cdh tournament this this big big movement for for the whole community um that after the first day of swiss everyone was just full goblin mode like full party mm-hmm. goblin like I think we literally closed the the hotel room out to the point where it's like, okay, oh yeah, a lot of us have to play top 16 in the morning. We should not go too hard, but like three in the morning, I think most of us went to bed and then woke up for a 10 o'clock players meeting. Um, but it was just, it was this huge celebration. It was like post COVID with this brand new organization who is now obviously killing the game. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it, there's nothing quite like it, which is why I think that that venue is always going to be so special, I think, to CEDH folks, because people who were there the first time are like, yeah, I mean, there's a reason it's all in 20 minutes, right? Like <laughs> this uh, this time around. So it's it's a very special venue. And I think a lot of people have that experience of like, you know, everyone from there. I mean, there were people who were literally coming in from Japan, you know, what I mean, to, to see this tournament because they met people online. And like, I mean, if there was one good thing about online play, it, it at least, you know, expanded the size of the community. If, if as much uh, we don't have it now due to some some cheating folks. I don't want to I dug at Steve a little bit when he was saying the gathering, but like magic, everything we said was about literally the gathering part of magic, which I think is really special. But all four of us met because of magic and we wouldn't have met if it wasn't for magic. Um, I met Ian at uh, an event that actually we were all at in uh, New York for the Nuka Penna pre-release oh, yeah. that we did. And that was the first time I met Ian. And I was like simping because I was I had my Winota play mat. And I was like, I know you like Winota. I love her too. And that's like how we met. And then I know that you and Steve met at uh, the the greatest place on earth. My first ever mountain tournament. Yeah. Magic 10K at uh, SCG Philly. Yeah. And so Valley like, Casino Bay. even then that was like, <laughs> even though you weren't like competing together, like you met each other in competitive environments. And the first time I ever went to like a comp magic event was because of, like Ian and I were talking about it. And I was like, I'm going to give this a go. And we played a tournament together. And like the day that I went to go leave, you know i was waiting for my uber home because i was planning on leaving earlier but ian top forward so i stayed until like it was almost midnight when he finished mm-hmm. to watch him play the finals because i was like you know my friend supported me i had like a very emotional day and he supported me so i wanted to support him and i think it's really cool that like competitive magic still like kind of brought our relationships together which is kind of cool and obviously magic brought our friendships together and i think it's the best part of all that's all i agree cheesy yeah, i agree that's cute Thank yeah. you, Brad Nelson, yeah. for having Melee crash. <laughs> so we were able to walk to the pairing sport together. Yes, we love you, Brad. Ooh, fix Melee, please. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Also, Valley Forge Casino and Resort, shout out. Yes. I guess um, we could we could say a lot more. We have a couple questions we'll get to, like just at least one. But what is your tip for people who want to get into comp magic? Like any tips, any beginner tips, like anything you want to say? So any tips you have, just like yeah. any tips you want to give are, are fine. But yeah, you can go to the Sorrel yeah. to find stuff to learn. Like if you want to go play uh, Modern at your LGS or you want to play, um, I know like some of us will do like CDH nights. We'll have kind of like a Discord and put a community together. And if you don't have that there, you could definitely start one and just kind of put out the word that you want that at least for CDH. But I know most places will do like standard night and yeah, things like that. Draft, yeah. draft on Fridays. Mm-hmm. Like it's just, it's all about getting over that hurdle of going to FNM for the first time. Yeah. That's really what it's about. Like, and a lot of like people like, you know, maybe we people in my part of the scene give off like bad vibes, but I swear at the local level, that's not the case. If you just go your first time, even if you lose, you will enjoy it or you will want to get better. Um, and if you don't want to get better, maybe competitive magic stuff for you, but also, <laughs> um, yeah, just, just get over that hurdle of going for the first time. And then if you want to improve, just play a lot, Yeah, play a lot. That's, and I think my one little piece of advice I've mentioned in the Q and a podcast too, I think before, or in some of the competitive lore we talked about is don't be afraid to look stupid yep. that is the one thing yes. i still to this yes. day have a hard time getting over i have a hard time even playing with steve and i tell him i don't want you to watch me misplay because i'm embarrassed i get embarrassed yeah yeah i don't <laughs> but there's nothing to be embarrassed about but if you cannot be embarrassed and not be afraid to make a mistake you can become a better player you can also go to uh, people for coaching. So if you are afraid of being embarrassed and you don't want to make silly plays, uh, we have a lot of friends I know that like Mason does coaching. Um, if you're looking for somebody to CDH, Ian does coaching. And so you can talk to those people about your fears and reservations. And I think people don't realize like coaching could be not just about playing the deck. It could be about like how you're presenting yourself at the table, how to get over your fears, how to like what you bring with you to your events and how to just like 
encompass everything so you feel more confident as a player and then you go through your decks and you can go through your lines and things like that too coaching's great i've gotten coached by mason a few times and some of the things we talked about had nothing to do with just like what card do i play here a lot of time it's yeah. about fear of mulliganing or you know processes everything else mm-hmm. it's very beneficial yep. if you want to improve as a player yeah i think you said mulliganing and i was like yeah immediately that is like the hardest, the hardest fucking thing, thing yeah, ever <laughs> magic's a mental game Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like what you do the week leading up to the actual game that you play also matters. Yep. So yeah. it's like, that's what the, they'll teach. No, I mean, but like Steve, I think said it perfectly, which is like, yeah, play, play magic. Like that is a really good way to get better at magic. I put in hundreds of hours during COVID because I had the time to, and you know what? It, it made me a lot better of a player and made me learn the game. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm definitely shout out to the, the, to the fellow coaches in the world. Um, you know, we're here to like help folks who want to get started in the right direction. Right. Um, so the reason I do what I do is a job because not only, you know, I see a benefit in it, but like genuinely, I think, you know, being able to get people passionate about the things that I've literally dedicated my career to doing, uh, it turns out it's, it's, it's really something I, you know, myself and others care about. Right. Um, uh, but in genuine, like it's loving the game and putting in effort in the sense that like you are trying. And for me, like that creative itch, that, that curiosity, that's been a huge part of it for me too, right? It's just like scratching that itch, right? Enjoying like, oh, what does this deck do? It wasn't at first a competitive edge. I wasn't like, I'm going to spike this tournament. What does this deck do? It was like, oh, cool, a new deck. I want to learn about that thing. And now I know whenever I play against a niche strategy, I'm like, oh yeah, I can describe most of your deck list. And people are like, that's horrifying. (laughs) I will say, I feel like there's a lot of things we talked about today. And even with all the things that we did talk about, I feel like there's so many questions. Like I know we had some questions for viewers and I would love to get into those, but obviously we're going past the hour mark at this point. So uh, I would love if you're listening or you're over on our YouTube, if you can leave any sort of questions that you have for Steve, Ian, me, Tori, whoever, when it comes to whatever formats or whatever question you have about competitive play, because maybe we could do like a little part two. Yeah. And kind of we can even make some, if you're on YouTube and follow us and yep. subscribe to our YouTube, we can even reply to some of those questions mm-hmm. with shorts um, and yep. delve a little bit deeper deeper into some of the comments and questions you might have yeah I think it's like nice to have so many different perspectives because you know obviously Tori and I are like you know very new to the scene as far as competitive goes we're women right like there's definitely a lot we could say about playing competitive magic as women and you know for the two of you who have been successful and who've been playing for so long and have been trying like new decks and many things and, and have been through magic for so long I think it gives a really good perspective from four different people um so I would love to answer those questions like Tori said maybe we'll do some shorts maybe we'll do a part two things like that and you know thank you for asking about this a lot of the stuff I did have as topics were things that were commonly asked regardless because people want to learn how to get more comfortable with these formats and how to try magic in a different way because there's so many formats and I think that's the best part of magic definitely besides the gathering (laughs) yeah yeah and I'm always always here to see people from whether you're a you know only EDH player trying to get into competitive magic or you're a competitive magic player who wants to play magic for just fun and no stakes it's great to just go into each different world yeah i will say you too you can also just play modern for fun like i know that was a question i was asked do you can play those formats yeah. for fun you don't ever have to play it to play at the high competitive level if you don't want to do that if you want to play pioneer you could do that yeah. um yeah and inversely you can play cedh as a casual format we do too yeah yep yeah that's how i play it you do? Really, that's the same yeah, don't Me play too. It in tournaments yeah. <laughs> and you guys are both good at it <laughs> Um, if you would like to, <laughs> if you would like to support Ian and Steve, we do have their info in the description. Uh, Ian is available on YouTube doing CDH content. Steve is like not a content creator, but kind of is because he makes really good content on Twitter now known as X. Um, and he acts like it's not good, but it's actually really, really funny. <laughs> it's bad. It's very good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, and they're also frequently here on Scry Babies. There are two people that make these shows happen. They make our podcast happen. They make our live gameplay happen. Uh, so, they if like you, the envelopes, yes, they like yes. the envelopes. They do the work. So, if you enjoy our episodes, it is partially because these two amazing humans here help us make it happen. So, you can go show them some love and support them. <laughs> I think that's it. Check out TCG Player. Check out Dragon Shield. Check out our Patreon and our Bonfire. All that good stuff is in the description down below. Anything you want to plug? Don't forget to like and comment on this video. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to give us a rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. It helps us more than you know. And thank you for listening. Thank you to our Comp Magic players. Our first guest. Ooh, our first guest. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Good game. Oh, no more hands. <laughs> GG. GG's. 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 G